Hi everybody, it's me, Emily Rogers. I work in Casa La Paz, the retail store here at Tree of Life Nursery. It's nice to meet you. I hope you are having a wonderful day and I hope you enjoy our newest talk by Katie Newman called Shady with Katie, where Katie will teach you about her favorite native plants that grow in the shade. Whether they go into pots or in the ground, she's going to teach you how to brighten up darker spots of your garden. So I hope you enjoy. So before we go into some of the awesome container plants that we have available here at Tree of Life Nursery, I wanted to let you know about two of my favorite Tree of Life specialty seed mixes that are available for purchase both in our online store and here at Casa La Paz in our roundhouse area. So the first one obviously is the Shade Mix, which has a mixture of the Purple Houses, the Yarrow, the Lenanthus, Blue Flax, and Baby Blue Eyes. It's a really wonderful mix. All of these species can handle full shade. Um, really nice mixture of blues, whites, and purple flowers that's gonna look really beautiful in the garden. But we also have the Nature Mix. Now the Nature Mix has a lot of full sun, seed, uh, full sun plant seeds in it, but it also has a lot of uh, seeds in it that can do full, full to partial shade. And two of my favorites that are in the Nature Mix that can do full shade to partial shade are the Farewell to Spring and the Mountain Garland. So those are our two Clarkia species. And I personally live in an apartment complex. I have tall walls, tall trees surrounding my entire patio and the back alleyway behind my apartment. So I don't get a lot of sun, um, but I planted the Nature Mix with the Shade Mix in my planters out in the back that only gets about one hour of sunlight a day and it's mostly dappled sunlight and it's really in full shade and um, this spring the mountain garland just completely took over it looked so gorgeous and then kind of later on in the season i had those baby blue eyes and some of the farewell to spring popping up but it's a really wonderful mix especially if you have a mixture of shade and sun in your garden you can kind of without a doubt know that you'll be okay planting the nature mix something's gonna pop up in the garden so without further ado so we have some shady ground covers as well as some sub shrubs so sub shrubs are just you know they're not ground covers they're not shrubs they're they're sub shrubs uh, we have the yarrow and I'm using botanical names here because I really want you guys to get familiar with using botanical names even if you're just a gardener it's really important to learn these botanical names because every nursery can use different common names for some of these plants so I'll try to go through using both botanical and common name but just so you know that's why I'm using a lot of the Latin names here in this talk because I want you to know exactly what you're asking for when you go to those nurseries if you're not here at Tree of Life. So first one's going to be Achillea millifolium. That's the yarrow. We're going to go into some greater um, discussion on that one but some of these that are on this list I'm not going into full detail about today. Um, so Armeria meridima, that's the California sea thrift or sea pink thrift. Um, that one I'm not going into great detail just because you really want to be more coastal if you're planting that one and it can do full sun, but it's a great plant. Highly recommend it if you can get your hands on it. The other one is Epipactus gigantea. Not going into a lot of detail on that one just because it can be harder to find in the nursery trade. We do have it here at Tree of Life Nursery, so come on in if you want one. Um, it's the California stream orchid. It's a really rare and beautiful plant. And then uh, Pycnanthemum californicum. That is a really beautiful ground cover in the mint family. So the common name for Pycnanthemum is gonna be the mountain mint. So it's in the mint family. It smells amazing, really beautiful lush um, leaves on that one. And then I think that's it. I think we're gonna go into pretty good detail on all the rest of these on this slide. So let's get into it. First off, we're gonna be talking about Kevin's favorite, the Dudleya. So we're going to talk about Dudleyas. We have a lot of different species of Dudleya. Um, 
My favorite for full shade is actually the Dudleya stolonifera, the Laguna Beach Live Forever. So in this photo, you'll see the Dudleya stolonifera, the Laguna Beach Live Forever in a hanging basket that was actually taken at our production manager, Kevin Allison's yard on a north facing um, fence. So those Dudleya barely get any sun, but as you can see, they're in full bloom. They're very happy. So if you have a very, very shady area, highly recommend the Dudleya stolonifera. Um, the one that you see in the little tortoise shaped container that's on my patio, which only gets about four hours of direct sunlight a day. Um, and the rest of the day, it's in pretty much full shade. Um, I have it in the tortoise container because it's my tortoise's favorite snack. So if you have a pet desert tortoise, the Dudleya um, viscida, uh, it, the sticky live forever is a really great snack for them. So hot tip. Um, but there's a lot of different Dudleyas you can use in partial to full shade. I kind of recommend staying away from anything that has the chalky white um, film on it. So stay away from Dudleya bretonii or Dudleya pulverulenta. Those ones have that white ch uh, chalky substance on them so they can protect themselves from the sun. They are more than happy to be in full sun, but any of like the green or kind of blue-green Dudleyas, those are going to be okay for partial shade. So our next one is Achillea millifolium or yarrow. Um, the straight species has a white flower. You can see it down in the bottom two photos and those are kind of planted in mass as lawn substitutes. So I love this plant just because of its adaptability. It can go in full sun or full shade. It can handle a variety of different soils. It can be used as a lawn substitute or just as an accent in the garden. This is a very important plant for butterflies because of the profuse blooms that it puts on. So if you're looking to plant a butterfly garden, you definitely want to add in some yarrow. It has a really extensive um, growing period during the spring. So a lot of times people plant them in the spring and they're worried like, oh my gosh, this plant is gonna take over. But once it's done putting on that new growth in the spring, it'll really start to calm down and just focus on putting out those blooms throughout the summer. And then you can kind of prune it back in the fall and winter. Um, it is, It does spread, um, but it's really easy to keep contained. Uh, you can use it in containers as well. As long as you're not putting it in a super boggy, wet area, it's not going to spread too much. So just make sure you're watching on the water and you should be fine. We have a few different varieties um, available like the Achillea paprika, that's the red one that you see there, and the Achillea island pink, that's the pink one. They're all really beautiful. Um, you can find different colors at different nurseries, but those are the two ones that we sell here at Tree of Life. Asclepia speciosa. So everyone knows milkweed and why it's so important for our monarch butterfly friends. But this one doesn't get talked about as much because it's more of a Northern California species. It's still a native California milkweed, um, but it's more Northern California kind of woodland or sorry, meadow areas of Northern California. So not a lot of people are planting it here in Southern California. If, and that's fine if you wanna to stick to, you know, locally spe local species only, that's your prerogative. But I will say if you want milkweed, but you don't have a full sun area in your yard or on your patio, then you can go with the Northern California species showy milkweed. So again, you can do the narrow leaf milkweed and the woolly milkweed or um, Cotolo milkweed if that's what you wanna stick with. But not everyone has full sun for those guys and everyone wants to help the butterflies. So highly recommend um, going with the showy milkweed for our shade garden, um, butterfly gardens. Um, these do go dormant in the winter. So, and not really a ground cover, not really a shrub, but they're definitely a sub shrub. Um, so they'll show up um, in late fall to early spring, depending on where you live. Here in Southern California, we really don't see our milkweed showing up until late spring, early summer, and then they're gonna bloom throughout the summer. And they'll be, they'll be looking good in the garden all throughout summer and into late fall. That's when they're gonna start to go dormant. If you don't see your Asclepius or milkweed going dormant in the late fall, then you can just cut it back all the way to the ground. It'll still pop up the next year. You just wanna make sure you're planting it near other plants or maybe put a rock by it so you remember where it is 
remember not to neglect watering it and then you can you know try to find it popping back up the next spring all right anamopsis californica this is one of my favorite plants i love this plant it's more of like a marsh estuary plant you can find it near your local wetlands um, there's a really beautiful um, little swath of this growing at um, Peters Canyon in Orange County. Um, they also uh, planted a bunch of this recently for restoration in the uh, upper Newport Back Bay. Um, this has a large cone with white leaves that look like they're part of the flower, but those large white leaves are actually just leaves. Um, they're not part of the cone, which the cone is made up of like tons of tiny little flowers. So it's just like a fun fact about that guy. Um, but it does kind of smell like jasmine too. So a lot of people don't realize that. They just think it kind of looks like a weed, but it's a beautiful plant. It smells really nice. If you have a shady spot that's a little bit boggier, like maybe you don't have as good of drainage in a certain shady area of your garden, I highly recommend planting this guy. Um, without supplemental water, it'll stay pretty compact, but if you have a really, really wet area and the sprinklers are going off all the time, it will run and kind of take over. So just something to be a little bit cautious about. Um, so yeah, just not tons of water if you want to keep it contained. It can handle drier soils as well. So um, Yerba Mansa, the Anam Anamopsis californica, um, it does go kind of winter semi-deciduous, but it just depends, again, how much water it's getting, how much sun it's getting. If it's in full shade, it probably won't go very deciduous. Um, and the flowers come out in the spring to the summer, so you can enjoy it throughout, you know, the times of the year that you want to be outside enjoying your garden anyways. Let's talk about strawberries. So yes, strawberries are California native plants. We have our woodland strawberry and our beach strawberry. So we've got the botanical name is Fragaria. If you're looking for more of the woodland strawberry, you know, try to find Fragaria vesca. And if you live uh, more near the coast, I would go with Fragaria chiloensis or one of its cultivars, Fragaria chiloensis cheval. Um, we also have a hybrid strawberry here at Tree of Life called Hybrid Pink. Um, some, some nurseries you might find it called uh, Pink Panther, Panther, Pink Panda, something like that. Anyways, um, you can see it there. It has really pretty pink flowers um, and they all put on like the same amount of berries regardless of whether it's the beach strawberry or the woodland strawberry. They all spread. Um, quite a bit so you you can use it as a ground cover in an area that you really want to see a lot of lush greenery somewhere where you won't mind it kind of climbing over some of your other plants or if it's just going to be on its own so you can see in the pictures here we have it kind of competing with our maria maritima in that top um, photo and as well as the yarrow um, really great for rock gardens as well, or if you want to plant it near your vegetable gardens and your other um, kind of edible garden areas, it can handle a little bit more water. So um, even though it is a drought tolerant plant, it can go really low water. It can also be super adaptable with higher water amounts. So if you want to keep all of your edible stuff together, that should be fine. Um, this is, the fruit is edible. Um, another great aspect of this plant is that it's a late winter bloomer. So you're going to be not only providing food for yourself in the summer, but also really important nectar and po uh, pollen plant for bees and butterflies in the late winter and early spring before a lot of the other California native plants start putting on their blooms. Hookra cultivars. So uh, Hookra maxima is going to be the coral bells that you see in the bottom left photo. I think that's, yeah, bottom left. Um, that is the straight species that most of our cultivars came from. But all of our cultivars, we have many, many cultivars available. They all kind of range from a really beautiful white flower to even dark pink, dark red. Um, you'll see the bottom right photo. That's actually my back alleyway planter. So that's the one I was telling you about. I really only get like one hour of sunlight a day, maybe another hour of dappled sunlight. But for the most part, this planter is in full shade. 
Um, and those hookahs, the coral bells in my planter still bloom, even though they're only getting about an hour of sunlight a day. So this is a really great plant for shade. Uh, it looks beautiful planted in, in mass underneath an oak tree or any other shady trees that you have in your yard. Um, really amazing blooms that if you cut the flowers back, it'll put off um, new shoots. So obviously we want it because it's a great nectar source for hummingbirds and butterflies, but it's also a beautiful cut flower in the home. So you can rest assured if you want cut flowers for indoors that it'll put on um, new growth throughout the spring and the summer if you keep cutting it back or just leave them on there for the birds and the bees to enjoy whatever's clever for you and your garden. Um, so I have Wendy um, and Old La Rochette varieties planted in my mostly shade garden and I have blooms all spring and all summer. So this is a, a wonderful plant, highly recommend it. It's evergreen, um, can't really go wrong. Very adaptable in different kinds of soils. So, oh, and in containers. So if you wanna plant it in a container like I did, it grows really well with other shady plants like Salvia spathaceae, the hummingbird sage, and the um, yerba mansa and yerba buena as well. All right, so now that I've convinced you all to purchase a coral bell and plant it in your garden, um, we're gonna talk about its best friend, the iris Pacific Coast hybrids or iris PCH as we call them here at the nursery. Um, this is another evergreen ground cover. It's more of a clumper. It grows really well as a mass planting underneath those oak trees. So you can kind of mix it in with the coral bells if you want a lot of color in the springtime. Um, it can handle very low water to a little bit higher water. It does really great in mass plantings, as I said, or in rock gardens, kind of here and there dispersed. It does really well in containers. Um, this picture on the bottom that was taken here at Tree of Life Nursery, that's my office you see in the background. If you've never been here before, we have a lot of our California native plants in the ground dispersed around the nursery so you can see what they look like, you know, as mature plants. Um, and this is the iris PCH kind of in a mass planting. If you want to see a really great um, rock garden with iris, Theodore Payne Foundation has a really beautiful rock garden area in full shade. You can check out some of the other iris PCH. Um, low water, yellow to purple flowers. They mostly bloom in the spring. Um, and just a great like woodland meadow garden themed plant. So definitely recommend this guy. We have a lot of varieties available. They're usually available, like more varieties are available in the springtime. That's when they're in full bloom and we can actually see what color we're <laughs> selling to you guys. So definitely come in the early to mid spring for some of these. We do have some one gallon container plants available now that are gonna be kind of mixed colors though. Alrighty, so my favorite, this is Mirabilis lavis, formerly Mir Mirabilis californica, or the wishbone bush, or desert wishbone bush, depending on who you ask. Um, I had to put in there that it's summer semi-deciduous, but really, if you give it some supplemental water in the summertime, I've never seen mine go deciduous. I live about four to five miles away from the coastline in Costa Mesa. This is one that I have in my mostly shaded patio garden. It is in the ground, not in a container, and it spreads really nicely. It's super easy to prune back. It's not a very finicky plant. If you're, a, if you're new to native plants, then I highly recommend this as a really nice, almost evergreen ground, ground cover. Um, another reason this is one of my favorites is because it's another great snack for my desert tortoise. So. Again, if you have a desert tortoise, you want to plant some wishbone bush, it's such a profuse grower that you can just keep taking cuttings from it and putting them inside for your pet or as like a cut flower in a vase um, and it'll grow back really quickly. Um, the flowers do close up midday, so you're going to see those really beautiful kind of dark purple, light pink to white flowers open in the early morning and in the late afternoon and then midday when it's hot out, they kind of close up. Um, it's a California chaparral plant, but not a lot of people know about it. So definitely recommend this one, get to know it a little bit better. Try it out in your garden. It can also be used in containers. So 
whatever you're working with, you probably have a spot for the wishbone bush. I, I guarantee it. Okay, so this next one is what Mike Evans, uh, co-founder and own, part owner of Tree of Life Nursery, calls the best and most highly recommended plant for dry shade. So uh, take it from Mike, this is one of the best plants that you can use in a dry shade area of your garden. Um, we love to plant it underneath oak trees. We actually have it right behind me. I'm underneath a coast live oak right now and behind me on the ground, it's just covered in the Ribes viburnifolium, which is also called Catalina Current or Catalina Perfume. Uh, called Catalina Perfume because of its really, really nice scent. Um, it's kind of up for debate what the scent is. To me, it smells kind of peppery and sweet, but some people say it smells more citrusy um, or just sweet. So it's kind of up in the air. Everybody has a different opinion about this. So um, come on down to the nursery and try it out. Just take a leaf off and crumple it in your hands and see what you think. Regardless, everybody thinks it smells good, especially after a rainy day. So we don't get a ton of rain here in Southern California, but this plant is one that you want for those rainy days in your garden. It is really special. Um, it is native to the Channel Islands, um, but it just has those really large glossy green leaves and then these really cute maroon flowers that it gets in the springtime. Those flowers eventually turn into fruit during the summer months, which is a great resource for uh, birds in the area. So if you want something that has a lot of great habitat value, that is an easy plant to take care of, can handle full shade to partial shade, um, or if you just have an area that needs a little bit of color, I highly recommend this plant. Um, if you have a Channel Islands theme or coastal theme garden, you wanna go with some Ribes viburnifolium. Um, it does spread about five feet, but it handles pruning really well. So there, the possibilities are endless with this guy. Our Monardella species, we have a ton of different um, species and varieties available that are California natives. So I can't go into each one super in depth, but I will say that we always usually have willowy monardella, coyote mint, and uh, red monardella available in the nursery. These are all California native mints that are gonna be great for cocktails, mocktails, and tea. And they're also one of the best plants that you can use in your garden for butterfly nectar sources. So if you're planting a butterfly garden, you want one of the monardellas in your garden. It's very important. We have the pale swallowtail butterfly on what looks like a uh, mountain coyote mint flower. Um, but they're really profuse bloomers. They look beautiful in the garden. You definitely want to plant this near your patio or a seating area so that you can enjoy the scent um, or near your kitchen garden if you have one. Um, for me, my kitchen garden is the back alleyway where I have a uh, little planter on the wall, on the concrete wall. So everyone has, uh, you know, different uses for plants, but I love having this plant available to me. Um, definitely recommend it if you want something that's going to have many uses in your garden so you're going to get tons of use out of this it's going to look good all year round you can get purple flowers or red flowers and different sizes and shapes of leaves depending on which monardella you're going with so just come on down to the nursery and check out the different varieties that we have i'm sure you'll find some, uh, one of them that'll work for your garden california hedge nettle stackies bulata this is one of the easier plants to grow in the California garden. Um, it's not exactly drought tolerant, but it's a very important food source for songbirds, hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. So it's a great habitat plant. Um, it's kind of native to more of our like wetter, boggier areas of California. So you'll find it near streams or rivers or estuaries all throughout California. Um, one of our coworkers here at Tree of Life, Jeffrey, you'll see him out in retail. Um, he has this as an understory plant beneath his fruit trees. So, you know, we all want our victory gardens and we want to show you that you can have your native California plants mixed in and without your edible gardens. So if you have fruit trees and you're looking for something to kind of act as a pollinator attractor, as well as the ground cover, I highly recommend going with the California hedge nettle. Um, unlike the common name, it's 
if, if that doesn't sting you, like um, a lot of people kind of assume that it's like stinging nettle, but it's not. It's really soft, lush leaves. I love running my hand across it and just kind of getting that really beautiful aroma um, that it puts off. This is also in the Lamiaceae family, which is the mint family. So really nice aroma. Um, it's also edible. Jeffrey makes a uh, essential oil with all of the leaves that he cuts off um, from his because it does put on a lot of new growth. So you're going to have to kind of trim it back at least once a year. Otherwise it can, you know, get pretty big in the garden. Um, but if you keep it in a container, it doesn't take over too much. Um, we had one of our other retail employees, Jonathan, plant this in a container last year with a hookara as well as a, um, uh, yerba buena and it looked so beautiful and everybody in the nursery would go on their lunch breaks and walk out to retail just to brush their hand over this container garden that he had created with all of these really aromatic lush green plants. Um, beautiful flowers you can see they're kind of um, tubular shaped so that's why they're great for hummingbirds as well. Um, yeah definitely a great plant for the garden. And then we're going to everybody's favorite hummingbird sage. Now this is a plant that definitely brings people into the nursery for the first time. So people who've never heard of California native plants or know that that's even a thing that you can plant in your garden, they hear about hummingbird sage and they flock to Tree of Life Nursery to find this plant. And it is a really wonderful plant. I mean, you can see just from the photos, I mean, it's one of the only sages that's native to California that has that really pink red flower. So that alone makes it very unique and special. Everybody wants this plant. Um, it also has this really sticky residue on both the leaves and the flowers that smells amazing. It's unlike any other sage. Um, I've actually made a really wonderful cocktail using this plant. So I'll just take two or three of the leaves off of the plant and put it in a uh, put it on the stove with some uh, water and sugar and boil it down to make some simple syrup. And that makes a really herbaceous, sweet, um, simple syrup for cocktails using some gin or vodka as, and some lemonade. So it's a really great like summer cocktail plant, highly recommend it. Um, it's also got some beautiful flowers that are great in like bouquets and cut flower arrangements. So because it is such a profuse bloomer, I don't feel bad taking off a couple of the stalks for indoor, indoor use. Um, I know we're all here trying to create habitat for the birds and the bees and the butterflies, but you know, we're also putting in a lot of effort to our gardens and we should be able to enjoy them and bring the outdoors inside once in a while. And this is one of those plants that you can do that with because you, know, you don't have to worry about it blooming a second time. It's gonna be blooming all spring and summer long. Um, it does well planted in mass as a ground cover in full shade um, or among other plants. So uh, you can see in one of the photos it's planted beneath a white sage. So the white sage kind of takes over, but the hummingbird sage kind of fills in the, the ground around the white sage. Um, and just a note that you want to plant this, even though it, it is a wonderful plant, it can be kind of susceptible to powdery mildew. So you want to make sure that you're planting it in, air, in an area that gets a lot of air circulation. So don't plant this in your courtyard or like your tiny container plant planters. Plant it in mass in an area that gets a lot of airflow. Um, and don't put too much mulch around it either because that mulch is going to kind of soak up a lot of that moisture which can kind of add to the powdery mildew uh, factor. So just something to be cautious of, but it's a wonderful plant. You definitely need it in your garden. And here's everybody's favorites. Uh, San Miguel Savory and Yerba Buena, Clinopodium de Glacii and Clinopodium Chandleri. Uh, it was formerly called Satureja. Chandleri and Saturea de Glacii. So you might see those names kind of intermixed on the internet if you're researching this plant. They're both evergreen kind of creeping ground covers. They're both gorgeous in containers. I got this photo of the Yerba Buena in a container with the um, California Gray Rush as well as the Baby Blue Eyes from Colin Dunleavy. This is one of his more formal gardens. Um, it's a gorgeous plant in that like large container. You can see it really trails down 
It has some, they both have really nice white uh, flowers in the spring, really small white flowers. They're both really herbaceous and both, they're both edible. So you can use them in teas or cocktails. Um, you can make a simple syrup with them, kind of similar to the hummingbird sage. Uh, they are both in the mint family. So definitely recommend this one if you want something that's just gonna kind of like fill in those areas around your other shade loving plants. So this one does creep, but it will. it is a, a water follower as well. So wherever you water, it will kind of creep to that area and, you know, kind of spread and tack. Um, but great for containers as well. I have this one. That's a picture of my back alleyway container garden. So you can kind of see that was like a year after I planted it. And it's just kind of creeping along, finding those areas that nothing is, nothing else is growing in and establishing like, okay, it's me, the San Miguel Savory. This is my spot um, in the shade. So I highly recommend that one just because it's so pretty. It's so subtle. It's not going to take over. It's super easy to maintain. And again, they just have so many different uses. So now we're going on to our shrubs. I know that was a lot of ground covers and a lot of sub shrubs, but there's just a lot that you can use in your garden. And it's one of my favorites to use because I have such a small area to work with. But if you have a larger area to work with, these are gonna be your plants that you wanna use for those partially shaded or fully shaded areas in your garden. First one being the Lepicinia fragrance. That's the fragrant pitcher sage. Um, and then we have our ribes species. We have a ton of ribes species available in the um, nursery. So those are gonna be both uh, currants and gooseberries. And just remember, if it's a gooseberry, it probably has thorns. If it doesn't have thorns, it's definitely a currant. Um, then we have our golden abundance Oregon grape. You can see the um, flowers, the inflorescence of all of its beautiful yellow flowers on the page here. Um, and then we have mock orange. Uh, the other white flower that you see there, that is the tree ane anemone or Carpentria californica. That's one of my favorite plants um, for a fully shaded or partially shaded area. We're not going to go into too much detail about it today just because I don't recommend planting it this time of year, but it's definitely a great option for a shade garden. Um, so come back in the fall for that plant, do a little bit of research. You can learn more about it on our website, on our online catalog, or by going to calscape.org for any of the plants that I've talked about today if you want to learn a little bit more. Um, next one is very important, the Frangula Californica varieties that we have available. That was formerly uh, Ramnus Californica, but you can just call it coffee berry and most nurseries will know what you're talking about. Um, and then the last one is the false indigo bush, the Amorpha fruticosa. Also not going into great detail about that today, but is a very important uh, kind of tall shrub, small tree form for butterfly gardens. Um, so if you're interested in a butterfly garden, definitely check out the Amorpha fruticosa. And um, while we can't go through all the Ribes species, I definitely wanted to talk to you guys about Ribes aureum variety gracilimum. So this is the golden currant, and this is one that we currently have available in the nursery for purchase. It is a winter deciduous plant. It's upright, but I love this one because as you can see in that larger photo, it grows well with other plants in the shade garden. Um, that's the ribes kind of growing up and around a elderberry tree um, in full shade. And it's just really large, beautiful leaves, gorgeous yellow kind of orangey flowers. It's so, so important for our, our native bees. Um, it can do full shade to partial shade. It gets kind of big, um, but you can see here it's growing with the white sage and so the white sage is kind of in front of in front of it, blocking it from the sun. But when it's you know not deciduous, when it's spring and summertime, it grows through the white sage to kind of show those beautiful yellow blooms. It's a really special, special plant, native to our chaparral and woodland areas. Does have edible berries. I don't think they taste good, but they are very important food for uh, our native indigenous communities. Um, if you want to learn more about um, indigenous uses of plants, we have a ton of books available in Casa La Paz. So definitely look into that. 
Um, and then our next one is the Mock Orange, Philadelphus Lewisii. This is a crowd pleaser just because, you know, as the common name suggests, these uh, blooms do smell like orange blossoms. If you've never smelled orange blossoms before, you're missing out. Um, it's an amazing scent, definitely uplifting. It's a winter deciduous shrub. Um, this picture right here is a Philadelphus that's planted underneath a large oak and sycamore. So really doesn't get too much light other than dappled light all day long, but really profuse bloomer even in that dappled light. Um, it does need some good drainage or loamy soil. So if you have super heavy clay, maybe be a little bit more cautious about planting this guy. Um, it can get pretty large, up to 12 feet tall. Um, it says uh, inches there in my uh, PowerPoint, but I meant feet, five to 12 feet tall with about a six foot spread. Um, and it does well, you know, just growing among other shade plants. So we have it here in the ground planted near a black walnut, a sycamore, and an oak tree. And they just look beautiful all planted together. So if you want kind of a mass planting of ev like evergreen and deciduous trees, highly recommend putting this one in there just because it, it's so wonderful to enjoy in the spring and summer. Okay, um, Lepicinia fragrance, fragrant pitcher sage. Thank you to Colin Dunleavy for this photo of it in uh, being used in the courtyard because that is the area where you wanna use it. Um, you want to make sure that this beautiful plant is somewhere where you can enjoy it in the garden. Um, it just not only smells so good, but those blooms on it are so unique and so special. Almost like a penstemon flower, but larger. Really important for hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, a great plant for cottage style gardens, or if you just want like a statement plant somewhere that's going to get the conversation started about California native plants. Um, definitely partial shade to full sun, um, but if you live inland, I would stick to more partial shade. I have this plant in my front patio area that gets about four hours of direct sunlight a day, and the rest of the day it's completely shaded. It does kind of change throughout the year, but this is a fast growing plant. It is doing exceptionally well in my garden. I can't recommend it enough and it's really easy to prune back. So you can prune it back once it's done flowering a little bit before the summer months um, or within the summer months. And then you can do your hard pruning in the fall when it's uh, cooled down a little bit. Um, but as you can see, it, it just has really lush, beautiful green leaves. Um, it's a great plant for the garden, especially a partially shaded garden. So if you have any questions about this one, definitely come in because we have used this for so many different recipes. Um, and Emily Rogers working in retail can definitely give you some hot tips on how to use this plant in your next cocktail or uh, cake recipe. So you never know. Oh, you guys are still listening. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Um, our next one is a very important pollinator habitat plant as well. This is Frangula californica, formerly Ramnus californica, or coffee berry, which is much easier to remember. Um, do not try to make coffee with this plant. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I remember hearing it's called coffee berry because European settlers um, saw Native Americans using it, um, but Native Americans used it for its branches, not necessarily its berries. And they tried to make, the European sellers tried to make a coffee substitute with it, but didn't work out so well for them. Um, just leave the berries for the birds and you'll be happy. This is an upright and mounding evergreen shrub for partial shade to full sun. Um, we have a lot of different varieties of coffee berry available in the nursery trade. And so they can kind of range anywhere from five to 15 feet tall to you know 10 feet spread but there are some varieties that are a little bit more compact and there's some that are kind of known to like stick to a more mounding form so just do your research kind of visit the nursery we have signs on all of our varieties so you can learn more about them I definitely want to plant this in an area with some good drainage it's going to have the cream flowers in spring um, which 
bees go crazy for. So if you're not a fan of bees, you know, maybe put this in an area, you know, in the back of your yard. But as far as, you know, creating habitat, this is a wonderful plant for the, for the garden. Um, I do want to say that we hear a lot about uh, branch dieback with this plant, which is totally avoidable. As long as you're using clean pruning shears, you should not experience branch dieback. So uh, if you want to follow along uh, our monthly blog, um, so like April in the Natural Garden, March in the Natural Garden, um, Mike Evans gives a lot of really great tips and tricks for pruning your plants. Um, so you definitely want to make sure you're using clean pruning shears with this guy. But if you're, you know, if you're doing everything right, you should have success with this plant. It is so important. Definitely plant it in your yard. Evergreen, super lush, super full. Can't, can't have a habitat garden without this guy. So there we go. All right, and now we're getting into our shady vines. So there are a few different vines that do well in um, either full or partial shade. I'm not going to talk too much about Kekiella cordifolia, the heart-shaped penstemon, or the Calistegia, or the Clematis today, um, or the Lanistera hispidula, the pink honeysuckle, just because we're running out of time here. But um, these are all plants that are great kind of vining or shrub, like viney, vining shrubs for the garden. Um, I don't recommend planting the heart-shaped penstemon this time of year, but we do have it available in the nursery. So if you have a shady area that you want the heart-shaped penstemon to grow in, highly recommend it. Um, the pictures you see on this slide are of the um, Anacapa pink morning glory. That's the, one of the Calistegia uh, species. And that's a beautiful one. I have it on my uh, patio growing up the wall but I do have to prune it back so it doesn't kind of grow into my neighbor's patio. Um, they don't mind, but still I don't want it to like completely take over. <laughs> so you do have to be a little careful with that one. Um, and then the Lanistera hispidula, the pink honeysuckle, uh, that's actually more of a vine than the Lanistera subspicata. Um, but it, it isn't um, always available in the nursery trade. So depending on where you're going to buy your native plants, you might not be able to find it. We do have it available here at Tree of Life Nursery right now. All right, so we're gonna talk about Lanistera subspicata. Um, so this is one of my favorites. Um, like I said, I have that kind of back patio alleyway area and I just had this big ugly concrete wall. So every time I went out my kitchen to go to the laundry room or to go to the garbage, I just had this ugly wall with nothing on it. And so I planted a Lanistera subspicata, the southern honeysuckle, and I just kind of tacked it up with some strings and some ropes. And it, you know, just filled in this ugly concrete wall with beautiful evergreen leaves. As I said, it's a full shade area. So I never really got those beautiful berries or the beautiful yellow flowers. Um, so not exactly using it for habitat in that sense, but I had a fully shaded area I, I work for a native plant nursery, so I went with the southern honeysuckle and it, it did its job. It filled in an ugly wall with beautiful lush greenery and I was happy. So um, definitely in partial shade, it will put on those berries and put on those beautiful yellow blooms. It's not really a vine. It's not really a shrub. It's a vining shrub. So you can use it on a slope to kind of take over an area or you can tack it up and use it more as a vine. But unlike the Lanistra hispidula, it won't completely vine and crawl over everything. It'll kind of go where you tell it to go. So definitely easier as a garden management plant. All right, Aristolochia californica. This is the California pipe vine. This one can definitely do full shade um, to full sun. It's a deciduous vine, so it's gonna go dormant, kind of like milk. It's got like the same lifestyle as the milkweed. It goes dormant in the fall and winter, comes back in the spring and summer. Really interesting um, flowers. It's called the Dutchman's pipe, as well as the California pipe vine. And you can kind of see why with those flower shapes. This is the host plant for the California pipe vine swallowtail butterfly really gorgeous blue butterfly that you don't see that often around these parts anymore. Um, you can use this on a trellis or a fence, but
but definitely recommend it for a butterfly garden. It's a gorgeous plant, really interesting, unique flowers, definitely a conversation starter. Um, that's the caterpillar on that leaf right there. That's a, a California pipe vine or Dutchman's pipe leaf with the California pipe vine swallowtail butterfly caterpillar munching on, down on it. Shady grasses, not exactly the type of plant you think about when you think of your shade gardens, but there are so many California native grasses that look beautiful in your shade gardens or partially shaded areas. Um, just if you're looking for something to fill in or if you're looking to do a mass planting, we have a lot of options for you. Um, this main photo on the screen, that is of the Tree of Life Nursery grass section in Casa La Paz. So as you can see, we have a lot of different varieties. Some of them are full sun. A lot of them are partial shade to full shade. So just come, come on down, take a look and see what we have available. There's definitely something that's gonna work for your garden. We have a ton of carrick species. We have Lamus condensatus canyon prince, Melica imperfecta, Juncus patens, and our many Festuca species and varieties. I'm not gonna to talk too much about Melica imperfecta today, but there is a ton of information you can find online. We have it available in the nursery right now if you wanna come and check out one of our signs. Um, I couldn't find a beautiful photo of it though, so I didn't wanna to talk too much about it and um, get your hopes up but it is native to our chaparral woodland and other dry areas. Super low water plant, really beautiful for partial shade. Um, we're gonna talk about Juncus patens, which is my personal favorite. This is the California Gray Rush. It is an evergreen grass, um, partial shade to full sun, medium to high water needs. So definitely plant it uh, like Colin Dunleavy did here in this beautiful container. Um, or you can plant it near your dry river bed or you know, maybe a fountain that you have in your garden or near a leaky water hose, any of those areas that have a little bit more water. Um, this is a really, really beautiful grass. It's got that really nice um, kind of silver green stem. And it also has a very clean and neat look to it, which makes it a really excellent addition for your more formal or elegant gardens. Um, so again, People tend to think California native gardens are like super wild and unkempt, but we have so many varieties of grasses and shrubs and ground covers and trees that take pruning really well that just naturally look elegant and, I don't know, structured. So definitely come on down if, if you aren't familiar with native plants, we probably have something for you like the beautiful California Gray Rush. Um, we have a ton of festuca species and varieties. The fescues are um, usually full shade to partial shade, um, but there are some full sun fescues. Usually low water, always adaptable. They're always in more of a clumping or fountain look. Some of them um, are a little bit more, um, I wanna say mounding clumping, like they kind of fall over on each other and make a really nice lush look when you plant a bunch of them in mass similar to our carrick species. Um, and then some of them are more upright and fountain looking. So that's the uh, Festuca uh, tumulicola, I think. Um, and then we have the Festuca californica. So you can see they have quite different looks, but there's a lot of varieties. So you'll probably find something that you're interested in. Um, and then we have our Lamus Canyon Prince. That's the Canyon Prince wild rye. This is an evergreen grass. It is in a fountain um, shape, partial shade to full sun. Uh, I really wanted to talk about this grass today because a lot of the information online says it's for full sun only. And I have tons of customers who use this plant in partial to almost full shade. And they honestly look better. They look more lush, more full all year round when you put them in a partially shaded area. They last a long time. You can plant them in mass. You can plant them next to your verbenas, your lilac verbenas, you can, for kind of that nice contrast of the purple blooms next to the blue, uh, blue gray foliage of the Canyon Prince. Um, and they get pretty big, so you can use them as a statement grass as well. It's not something you're gonna be using as a ground cover. This is a larger grass that really, really, you know, again, is a conversation starter. Um, definitely use it in a moonlight garden or um, for just creating contrast against like a stark wall. 
Um, there's a lot of uses for this one and please, please try it in your partially shaded areas because I guarantee it'll look beautiful all year round. We've got our Carrick species, um, the sedges. So a lot of different varieties, a lot of different species. Um, this is probably the grass that I recommend the most to people who are new to native plants. Pretty hard to kill, super adaptable, can do a lot of sun to very little sun. And you can see it in a few different um, settings here. We've got our Carex divulsa um, in that first meadow picture, Carex pregracillus in that second middle photo, and then Carex panza in the third photo. So tons of sedges. They look great in full shade to partial shade. Definitely check them out. Use them in your garden. And then we're going into our shady trees. So we have a ton of trees that can handle a little bit more shade. Um, some of them need a little bit more water, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about those, but um, definitely the more important ones for habitat I'm going to go over today. So um, you'll see that photo of those really beautiful conical flowers. That is the California buckeye flower. Um, really beautiful. They can be, we've heard that they're kind of poisonous to uh, European honeybees. Um, so if you're, you know, a bee gardener, maybe be a little bit more careful. They're fine for our native California bees. So it's just kind of a moral decision you have to make for yourself if you're using it in your garden. Um, and then other plant pictured here is of the California, Southern California black walnut, the Juglans californica. Um, those are the where the walnut, those are the big walnut pods that grow on the tree, really beautiful. We don't have it available in the nursery right now. We are working on getting some more available for 2022 sales because the Juglans Californica has some of the most um, carbon sequestering abilities as from any of our other native California trees. So it's a super important um, plant not just for you know creating habitat but also providing safe environment for humans because we want clean air so uh, we are working on getting that one available for you soon and now we get to talk about elderberry the beautiful sambucus this is our favorite tree for many reasons and it will be your favorite tree for many reasons too um, all parts of this tree were used by California indigenous peoples, whether it be for food or basketry or for um, medicinal purposes. So really important um, plant just for that reason alone. It's also a really important uh, food source for California native birds. As you can see, it puts on a ton of berries um, in the summertime. The flowers are really great for po other pollinators. It's a great tree for planting near riverbeds or streams or for using on a slope for erosion control. Um, really low to medium water, so very adaptable. It prefers drainage um, in the soil. Um, so again, if you have super heavy clay, just be cautious, um, use some amendment or you know, be very uh, cautious with your watering techniques. Um, I will say it looks fabulous and lush almost all of the time. Um, it, it is a deciduous tree, but when it's not dormant, it's just one of those trees that makes you kind of stop and look at it. Um, Emily here at um, Tree of Life made me an elderberry pie for my birthday a few years ago. So that was kind of my introduction to trying it in recipes. It was really delicious. So hopefully we can get her to film her recipe um, for Tree of Life. She's made a lot of jams and cakes too, but the pie was um, very unique and special. So definitely something that made me kind of remember this tree. Um, anyways, plant Sambucus. It can do full sun, um, but I'm just saying like, if you have an area that gets a lot of shade and you're planting a one gallon tree in the shade, this will be okay. And then it'll grow large enough. And then once it's big enough and it's kind of reaching for the sun, it'll do okay there too. So um, if you have an area that's like, you know, maybe in the winter, it doesn't get very much sun. It's very shaded because of some buildings or whatever you have around. And then in the summer, all of a sudden it's like blasted with sun. This would be a, a good plant for those areas that are kind of like mixed throughout the year or even throughout the day. 
Umbellularia californica, California bay laurel. This plant will make you happy. It just, it smells good. That's all I have to say. That's just planted, it smells good. Uh, no, uh, so this is an evergreen tree. Um, I love this tree. I, I knew that the leaves smelled really good. It's similar to the European bay laurels that you use in cooking. You can use the leaves from this tree for cooking as well. But I had no idea how good these flowers smelled. Um, my first year working here at Tree of Life Nursery, I remember finding my boss, Laura, just kind of like staring off in the distance at something. And if you know Laura, you know if you see her staring off in the distance, it's because there's something really cool happening in nature and you need to like get in on it and see what's going on. So I walked up slowly and I said, hey Laura, like, see a, a bird or something? And she was like, no, I'm just enjoying the scent of this tree right now. And I was like, what? Like the umbellularia? Like what is she talking about? It smells so good, you guys. Like you have to plant this tree. It's really easy to prune too. So even though it can get like 20 to 45 feet tall by 10 to 30 feet wide, you can prune this back and keep it as a smaller tree if you want. You can train it into whatever shape you want. It handles pruning really well. You can even use it in a container. Um, you know, maybe for five to 10 years, it'll be really successful in a container before you need to move it into the ground. Um, but if you want to use it for those, you know, um, for cooking, it, it can do well in a container as well if you want to kind of keep it smaller. Um, other than that, I just really recommend this one just for happiness factor. I'm sure it's good for pollinators and stuff too, but I don't look into that because all I care about is how good it smells. Uh, Prunus alyssifolia, the holly leaf cherry. This is another really great one for um, full uh, sun to partial shade. So again, those areas where you want an evergreen tree, but you know, the sun just varies so much throughout the day or even throughout the year. You can plant this and it'll be happy. Um, uh, Native, indigenous California tribes did use this kind of similarly, similarly to um, acorns from our oak trees where the cherries are edible, but they have a lot of tannins in them. You don't want to eat too many to make your stomach super upset. So what they do or what they did um, is they would actually take the cherry pit and leach out the t uh, tannins from those, boiling, boiling them in water, laying them out in the sun, and then they'd grind them up similar to the acorns and make a meal out of it. So it's a very important food source for indigenous California tribes. Um, there's a lot of indigenous tribes who are still using this plant today. Um, so we definitely want to preserve its habitat as well as, you know, plant it in our gardens for future use. Um, I will say that it is a host plant for our swallowtail butterflies as well. So again, for butterfly gardens, you definitely want to use this um, small tree. Um, upright columnar, it definitely handles pruning really well. And it, it stays pretty small, you know, as for one of our California native trees, you know, we're so used to our big oak trees and our big sycamore trees. But if you want something evergreen, that's just really nice and compact, I recommend the Prunus alyssifolia, the holly leaf cherry. So that's all I have today for Shady with Katie. Um, those are just a few of some of the many shade loving plants here available here at Tree of Life Nursery and within the California native plant trade. Um, definitely do your own research, see what works best for you. And remember, everyone here at Tree of Life Nursery has probably killed way more plants than you ever will. So don't stress, just try things out, see what works. Stick with those shady areas of your garden for this season. If you want to learn more, please come on down to the nursery. Any of us would be happy to help you, you know, pick out the right plants for the right spot in your garden. You can also email us at inquiries at treeoflifenursery.com. Um, visit Casa La Paz for some books if you want to read more. Um, we have native plant flashcards as well as tons of books on designing and, you know, interesting books on the history of, you know, the plant and its use by indigenous cultures in California. Um, I recommend going on our website and downloading some of our Sage Advice PDFs. Um, stay tuned, we're getting a new website soon, so a lot of those are gonna be turned into blog posts, so you can check those out then. Um, and other than that, thanks for joining us today. 
I'm sorry I couldn't go into more detail, but I'm sure you guys are already bored enough, so we'll keep it at that. Thank you. <laughs> them as long grasses they're just for oh was that a hummingbird anyways um <laughs> oh my god <laughs>